Death Angel We may have heard of the Angel of Death, but what about a Death Angel? Is there a distinction between the two? We see this character appear in Exodus for those knowledgeable about the Angel of Death. Because the Egyptians declined to set free the enslaved Israelites, God sent several plagues upon them, the worst of which was the last plague. The last plague involves the angel of death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will bring yet one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. After that, he will let you go. When he lets you go, he will most certainly drive you out of here completely. Speak so that all of the people of Israel may hear and tell every man to ask from his neighbor and every woman to ask from her neighbor articles of silver and articles of gold. Exodus 11, 1 to 2, Amplified Bible. That may seem strange to you. The Hebrew enslaved people were to ask their Egyptian neighbors for silver and gold. Why? The Israelites didn't realize it at the time, but God was preparing them for a journey. The silver and gold were like an ATM withdrawal on the way out of town. And when you think about it, those wages were a pittance in comparison to Egypt's 400 years of slave labor. God knew exactly what those silver and gold coins would be used for when the new nation arrived at Mount Sinai in the desert. God already had something in mind that no one had ever imagined before, the tabernacle the Tent of Meeting, where the Israelites would be able to meet in close proximity with the awesome Holy God who had delivered them. God had not yet explained why they would require those precious metals. Ask for them, he said, and they did. It's known as obedience. Exodus 11, 3 The Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was greatly esteemed in the land of Egypt, both in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. Now, after God has spoken to Moses and told him what to say, after Moses had been told, you have favor in the eyes of the people, Moses returned to the royal chambers for one last interview with the king. Exodus 11, 4-6, Amplified Bible. Then Moses said, Thus says the Lord, At midnight I am going out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land, the pride, hope, and joy of Egypt, shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of cattle as well. There shall be a great cry of heartache and sorrow, throughout the land of Egypt, such as has never been before and such as shall never be again. He was telling Pharaoh, this includes you. Your own firstborn son will die at the stroke of midnight. There will be national distress. The morning that will grip Egypt will be without precedent. God was going to send a spiritual entity to do this task. There had been wars in the past, and there would be wars in the future. Egypt had just experienced nine plagues, and more national disasters were on the way. But there would never be another shockwave of grief like this one. Israel will be protected. Exodus 11, 7, Amplified Bible. But not even a dog will threaten any of the Israelites, whether man or animal so that you may know without any doubt and acknowledge how the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. As in previous disasters, the Hebrew population would be spared. There will be an exodus. Exodus 11, 8, Amplified Bible. All these servants of yours will come down to me and bow down before me, saying, get out you and all the people who follow you. After that, I will leave. And he left Pharaoh in the heat of anger. 
On that last word, out, he didn't have to apologise for the message or the force with which he delivered it. It was a message from God. As he delivered it, he seemed unstoppable. The time for patience had passed, and the impending judgment was harsh and severe. Pharaoh, you've withstood God long enough, it seemed to say. You've challenged him to act, and he will. You've reached the end of your rope. After exiting the company of Pharaoh, Moses returned and stood before the Israelites. He was through haggling with the king. Pharaoh was now in God's hands, and the punishment was to be served by the destroying angel. Now he could turn his attention to the people of Israel, helping them to understand God's instructions in these awesome moments before they severed themselves from Egypt forever. He would instruct them, and they would follow his instructions. It's known as obedience. To begin, the Lord desired that the people establish a memorial. He said to Moses and Aaron, Exodus 12, 1-2, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be the beginning of months to you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. From that day onwards, the Hebrew calendar would be arranged to remember the significance of the meaningful event that was about to follow. Exodus 12, 3-5 Tell all the congregation of Israel, on the tenth day of this month, they are to take a lamb or young goat for themselves, according to the size of the household of which he is the father, a lamb or young goat for each household. Now if the household is too small for a lamb to be consumed, let him and his next-door neighbour take one according to the number of people in the households. According to what each man can eat, you are to divide the lamb. Your lamb or young goat shall be perfect, without blemish or bodily defect, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Take note of how meticulous and specific these instructions become. Furthermore, they must apply some of the blood to the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses where they eat. One of the difficulties with reading a passage like this one is that some of us are overly familiar with it. You and I need to put ourselves in the sandals of those hearing Moses face to face. Consider yourself receiving these instructions for the first time. Keep in mind that the Hebrews had never done anything like this before. This was all new stuff, and it must have stunned these soon-to-be freed slaves. Picture a godly Hebrew family as they hear Moses repeat God's instructions. You're to take a lamb, one per family. After cutting the throat of that lamb and draining the blood out of it, you're to keep some of that blood. And with a branch of hyssop, you're to dip in the pan of blood and you're to smear it on the doorpost on each side. What's the doorpost? Well, if you stand in the center of your doorway, and put your hands out to each side, you'll be touching the doorposts. Got it? Okay. And you're also to smear some of that blood on the lintel. That's the horizontal beam just above the doorway. Those are the only places you're to put that blood. Understand? Exodus 12, 12 to 13. Amplified Bible. For I, the Lord, will pass through the land of Egypt on this night and will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and animal. Against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments, exhibiting their worthlessness. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the doorposts of the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I shall pass over you and no affliction shall happen to you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. I'm going to visit Egypt, God said. Tonight, I will invade every home where there is no blood on the door, but there will be blood on my people's doorways, and they will be spared. That night, history was made, 
because the people believed God's man and followed God's plan. As a result, the Lord told them, Now this day will be a memorial to you, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you are to celebrate it as an ordinance forever. Exodus 12, 14. The Lord went on to provide them with even more information. After that, he told them something important to remember. You must perform this rite when you enter the land that the Lord has promised to give you. Exodus 12, 25 to 26. When you enter the land which the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall keep and observe this service. When your children say to you, what does this service mean to you? Moses' instructions were to be passed down from generation to generation. Exodus 12, 27 to 28. You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads low and worshipped God. Then the Israelites went and did as they had been told. Just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. Pharaoh refused to comply. As a result, he exposed himself and his nation to the Lord's wrath. The Hebrews, on the other hand, heard the Lord's word through Moses and obeyed to the letter. As a result, they were greatly delivered. They created history, while Pharaoh was consumed by it. That dark night of the first Passover, those Israelites might not have felt like smearing lamb's blood on the lintel and doorposts of their home. They surely didn't understand the Lord's reasoning. They had no idea it would foreshadow a future Messiah who would pay the debt of sin with his own blood and die for the world's sins. They simply did it. They obeyed because they believed the Lord's word. They simply followed the instructions without questioning the whys and wherefores. They were glad they did it a few hours later. The night nobody slept. Exodus 12, 29. Now it happened at midnight that the Lord struck every firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of the cattle. Exodus 12, 30. Pharaoh got up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry of heartache and sorrow in Egypt for there was no house where there was not someone dead. He keeps his word. The destroying angel overlooked no one who wasn't prepared, not even the king. The Israelites were on their feet, eating roasted lamb and bitter herbs, listening to the horrible wailing across the land. Everyone among the Hebrews was alive. The slimy fingers of death plagued like an awful affliction but it didn't touch one of God's people. The word of God tells there wasn't a residence in Egypt where someone had not died. Think of it. What a shattering night that was. My mind cannot fully conceive it. Exodus 12, 31-32 Then he called for Moses and Aaron at night and said, Get up, get out from among my people, both you and the Israelites, and go, serve the Lord as you said. Take both your flocks and your herds as you have said, and go, and ask your God to bless me also. What a night! A large crowd marched through the streets toward the border, while the muffled wails and cries of the bereaved Egyptians echoed through the darkness. The angel of death is another name for the destroying angel. God used angelic beings, heavenly messengers of some kind, on numerous occasions to bring judgment to sinners on earth. This being is referred to as a destroying angel in various Bible translations. There is no clear biblical evidence 
that any one angel was designated as a destroying angel or an angel of death. The most we can say is that references to a destroying angel in the Bible are to a heavenly being or beings who came to destroy those under God's judgment. Instead of destroyer, some translations use angel of death, GMT, or death angel, NLT. In Hebrews 11:28, this being is referred to as the destroyer of the firstborn. Surprisingly, the original Hebrew text of Exodus 12:23 makes no mention of an angel. It simply states that the destroyer, the spoiler, or the one who causes harm, will slay Egypt's firstborn. Psalm 78 describes the plagues in Egypt and summarizes them as God unleashing a band of destroying angels. The Hebrew word for angel is used here, but it does not refer to a specific angel. God also sent a destroying angel, a heavenly messenger who brought destruction to judge the Israelites as a result of David's sin in numbering the people. From that morning until the end of the time allotted, the Lord sent a plague on Israel, and 70,000 people died from Dan to Beersheba. When the angel stretched out his hand to destroy Jerusalem, the Lord relented concerning the disaster, and said to the angel who was afflicting the people, Enough, withdraw your hand. The angel of the Lord was then at the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. When David saw the angel who was striking down the people, he said to the Lord, I have sinned. During King Hezekiah's reign, the Assyrians who attacked Jerusalem were also met by a destroying angel. That night, the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the dead bodies. 2 Kings 19, 32-35 In this passage, and in 2 Samuel 24, the destroying angel is called the angel of the Lord. Another angel who brought death and destruction is mentioned in the judgment of King Herod. Acts 12, 23 an angel with lethal intent, identified as the angel of the Lord, bearing a sword, gives a warning to Balaam. Numbers 22, 31-33, Amplified Bible. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his drawn sword in his hand. And he bowed his head and lay himself face down. The angel of the Lord said to him, why have you struck your donkey these three times? Behold, I have come out to stand against you, because your behavior was obstinate and contrary to me. The donkey saw me and turned away from me these three times. If she had not turned away from me, I would have certainly killed you now and let her live. And Jesus notes that angels will be involved in the end times judgment of the wicked, in none of these matters are the angels called the angel of destruction or the angel of death. We might refer to an angel who meets out God's judgment as an angel of destruction, but it is not an explicitly biblical term. 